They're emo. They're not metal. You call them dressing up with a bandana with grills and glasses. It's like Fallout Boy. That's how soft it is. This is a re-upload of a video that I did back in January of 2019. The original got blocked due to a copyright claim from Warner, so I took out the copyright claimed part, and now I am re-uploading it. It's definitely a little bit rough around the edges compared to the videos that I do now. I watched it and I was like, Wow, I'm a lot better making videos now than I was back then, or at least I hope I am. There's a few things that I would do differently now, but I still think that the basic ideas here are pretty good. I still love Avenged Sevenfold, so I thought I would re-upload it, and I hope you like it. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and welcome back to my How They Got Big series, where I look at important bands and I try to reverse engineer, unpack, and understand how and why they got so big. Today, I'm going to be talking about a band that I have a ton of respect for, which is Avenged Sevenfold. And the reason why I have so much respect for them is because they've become one of the biggest rock bands in the world without making a single compromise on their music. Like they've gone to number one on Billboard twice playing these like ridiculous five or six minute long progressive metal songs, which I think is pretty damn cool. And for those of you who aren't familiar or maybe you don't understand exactly how big this band is, they have seven studio albums, five of which have hit the Billboard top 10. They have four gold records and one platinum album, and they've headlined pretty much any rock festival you could think of from down download to not fest they've become part of that absolute top tier of legendary rock bands sharing the stage with metallica and system of a down and corn among many 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 others and like i said they got there without making a single musical compromise they've never written a song for the radio i think they have like one or two songs that are under four minutes long they never stop playing all the solos their latest album has a 15 minute long song on it everything that they've accomplished has been on their terms so how did they get there that is what i'm going to do my very best to explain in this video and with that out of the way, let's get into it. Key factor number one, they acted like rock stars and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I had to point to one particular moment that was the key to Avenged Sevenfold getting so big, I think it would be the video for Unholy Confessions. I remember seeing this on Headbangers Ball back in, I think 2004, right when it came out. And I was pretty into the whole Orange County metalcore chain reaction kind of bands like 18 Visions, Throwdown, Bleeding Through, all that stuff. And I think I'd maybe heard Avenged Sevenfold's name a couple times from their ties to that scene. They played with a few of those bands. They played Chain Reaction, the Showcase Theater, but I really had no idea who they were. I think I just assumed they were yet another Chain Reaction metalcore band. And then when I saw the video, I distinctly remember being very confused. I was like, wait a minute, who the fuck are these guys? They're playing to this huge crowd of kids who are going ape shit. They've got fan art on the walls of their bedroom. They're showing all these people with Avenged Sevenfold tattoos. Like, what's going on here? I was so confused. I was like, wow, I guess these guys must be really big and somehow I just missed it. And in hindsight, I think it was a little bit of fake it till you make it. Like, I don't think they were lying exactly, but maybe let's call it a sleight of hand, a small exaggeration of reality. Basically, they put together this video that presented the band in their best possible state. They played to a hometown crowd who loved them, who knew that they were filming a video. I'm sure if they played in, say, like Cleveland back then, there would have been 120 people at the show and 119 of them wouldn't know who they were, but it worked. The video made me think that they were the next big thing. And ironically, the song kind of doesn't even really sound like them. I remember laughing at how simple it was and thinking like, man, these guys can barely play their instruments. But anyway, like I said, it worked. It made them look like the next big thing and oftentimes when an artist appears to be the next big thing we treat them like the next big thing which means they become the next big thing and the hype that they got from that album and in particular that song and that video got them signed to a major label and that's where they took everything they did in that video and just turned it up to 11 basically just repeated that whole process and proved that it wasn't a fluke their next album, City of Evil, which I think might be my personal favorite in their catalog, is where they really perfected this formula. This is where they really rolled out the quote-unquote rock thing. On Waking the Fallen, they were a little bit more on the emo side, which I think wasn't really a fit for them, because these aren't skinny guys who look like they got stuffed in a locker or like somebody took their lunch money. They look more like they would have been on the football team in high school, and the emo thing to me just felt weird on them. If you look at the Unholy Confessions video, it's just so odd to me to see Matt wearing eyeshadow and doing the emo thing because he's like this big athletic guy in a sleeveless Metallica shirt. I mean, look at his arms. There is nothing emo about that. 
this is where they really came into their own. To me, they felt like the new Motley Crue or Guns N' Roses, but with a modern twist that wasn't like some corny revival thing or some joke band like Steel Panther. And this, I think, is what really set them apart from all the emo bands that were blowing up at the time like Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, and Taking Back Sunday. If those bands were for the kids who sat alone at lunch reading Harry Potter, Avenged Sevenfold were for the kids who were always getting kicked out of school for fighting and smoking in the bathroom. And personally, as much as I liked their music, I kind of hated that whole look and vibe back then because I'm just super not into the whole rock and roll party animal thing, but I totally see why it worked for them because it helped them carve out their own part of the marketplace. Nobody else was doing what they were doing at that time. They had this very unique position of being more metal than the emo bands, but more emo than the metal bands, and that they could also play better than everybody with one hand tied behind their back. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about for a newer band, standing out from the crowd. Because it's not enough to be good. You've got to be good and different. And it's just like, how do you listen to this and call it metal? How? Key factor number two, they make the music that they want to hear. The hardest part for me when I was thinking about this video was to understand why Avenged Sevenfold's music is so damn popular because, well, it's weird. Like, it goes against pretty much every rule for mainstream commercial success, with their average song being well over five minutes long with like 17 different parts, three solos, lyrics that make no sense. On paper, it's everything a band shouldn't do, and yet, obviously, it's worked incredibly well for them. Why? Well, the first thing is they're a lot like Slipknot in that their music is actually very diverse, despite how they're often labeled. Their songs are a combination of punk, metal, hard rock, prog, metalcore, and tons of other stuff, which basically means that anybody from the emo kids to guitar nerds to metalheads to the red state rockers and military wives, everybody can get into it. Everybody can find something they like. I think of it like a buffet with just all kinds of stuff jammed into it with pizza, sushi, kale salad, ice cream, orange chicken, tacos, cereal. It sounds like a weird combination, but basically no matter who you are, you can probably find something you like. So actually it works really well. And let me unpack that a bit with some really specific examples of what I'm talking about. People think of them as a straightforward metal or hard rock band, which I think really couldn't be further from the truth. These guys are just all over the place. To me, the foundation of what they do is actually like classic Orange County punk. Like if you took out all the leads and solos and fancy stuff and just stripped it down to like the bare frame, you'd have something that sounds a lot like the old punk band D.I. See what I mean? So that's like the foundation of the band, but what makes them really interesting to me on a musical level is all the other stuff they throw in on top of that. This is the stuff that I think a lot of people don't notice or don't give them any credit for, which is a real shame to me. They actually have a really serious progressive streak, like some of their early stuff sounds like straight up nerd prog metal. For example, listen to this part from The Wicked End off of City of Evil. And compare that to something like this song by a band called Blotted Science. Not too far apart, right? And if you're not familiar, Blotted Science is as nerdy as it gets. Now, I love the band, but they are just straight up neckbeard stuff. So the fact that Avenged Sevenfold sounds so similar to a band at that level to me is pretty interesting. And they've also talked a lot about how they're influenced by classic prog rock bands like King Crimson or Frank Zappa, which I can hear just plain as day. As one example of that, check out this song, Unbound. And then compare that to the King Crimson song, Court of the Crimson King. And I'm not calling that a ripoff or anything like that. I'm just saying the influence is very, very clear to me. And this actually makes perfect sense given how these guys grew up. As many of you know, Brian or Sinister Gate's dad is a professional guitarist and Brooks's brother is Chad Wackerman, who is an extremely accomplished drummer from like the 70s and 80s, who's probably most notable for playing with the legendary Frank Zappa. But really, as far as prog cred goes, the fact that Mike Portnoy wanted to play with them tells you everything that you need to know. If Mike Portnoy thinks they're legit, they're legit. And I could go on forever here. This is not even getting into all the oddball experimental songs they've done like Malaguena, Dear God, Exist, and A Little Piece of Heaven. You get the idea. They're just all over the place. The snobs talk about them like they're some meathead jock band for rednecks and football players, but when I actually listen to their music, it sounds like guys who are really into Dream Theater and Frank Zappa, the furthest thing possible from meathead stuff. And getting back to my original point, I think that's actually why it works for them, because they write what they want to hear, and I think they really don't give 
two fucks what anybody thinks of it. If anything, they've been kind of aggressive about not giving the fans what they want. It's kind of like Bring Me the Horizon in that the fans have been asking them to go back to Metalcore for years and years and years, and they keep saying, fuck you, we're never going to do it. And ironically, I think that is actually what has led to their commercial success. Because one of the interesting things about music, or really any kind of art, is that when people create something with the obvious goal of commercial success, it almost always flops. Because what we respond to in art is passion. We're drawn to artists that make the music that they want to hear. And when we get the feeling that an artist is doing something just to get famous or rich, I mean, that's kind of a turnoff, right? And I think that's especially true in our world, in the world of metal and punk and hardcore and all that stuff. These guys are straight up music nerds, and because of that, they're able to draw from this wide variety of influences in a really fluid, authentic way. And that is what makes their music connect with such a huge audience. The high school football player can get stoked on the Pantera mosh parts, and the prog nerd can geek out on the parts that sound like Dream Theater and King Crimson. And the glue that ties it all together is that passion, that they're writing what they want to hear. They're simplistic, and the solos, they all sound the same. How do you people like this shit? I'd rather listen to fucking Death Core. Which brings us to key factor number three, the support of the gaming, guitar, and drumming communities. If you're part of any of these communities, you understand why, because you understand how big and passionate all these communities are, and that if an artist is able to get the support of those communities, they have diehard fans for life, which is exactly what Avenged Sevenfold did, and I think that made a huge difference, especially in the early days of the band. As far as guitar goes, if you paid any attention to that world for the past basically 15 years, they've been a fixture in guitar magazines and websites since the beginning, since back in the City of Evil days, and for obvious reasons, because they're one of the very rare examples of a band that shreds while still staying musical. I think in a lot of ways they kind of filled that spot that Pantera was in for so long. And as far as drumming, well, if there's a modern band with a better roster of drummers than Avenged Sevenfold, I can't think of it. The Rev, of course, was an incredibly talented musician whose shoes are very hard to fill. I think he's actually really underrated. There's a lot of people who say that he was sloppy or wild, but to me, the fact that his replacement was Mike fucking Portnoy of Dream Theater, to me, that tells you everything you need to know about his talent. The next drummer, Aaron, was no joke, but their current drummer, Brooks Wackerman, is just a straight-up fucking monster. In my opinion, he's probably the best punk drummer of all time. I'm not going to make this video even longer by talking about him, but if you're into drums, look him up. He's amazing. But anyhow, as far as why this was so instrumental to their success, if you'll pardon the pun, I actually got a comment on one of my videos that I think sums it up very well. I remember the day they hit number one on TRL, a heavy metal band hitting number one on a teeny bopper show. It vindicated every kid who was spending six hours a day in their room practicing sweet picking to pull off transitions on guitar, or the kid spending every free hour building up his double bass chops and linear drum fill vocabulary. I think that's exactly right, and that's why they got the support of millions of passionate guitarists and drummers very early on in the band. And once those people love you, they love you forever. They're not Fairweather fans. Just ask Periphery how valuable those fans are. And along the same lines, and this is something I think a lot of people don't realize, they also had the support of the gaming community. For those who don't know, they've been very prominently featured in a bunch of absolutely massive video games going back to as early as 2003. Madden, Need for Speed, NHL, Saints Row, Guitar Hero, Rock Band, and maybe most importantly, Call of Duty. And if you're a gamer, you know how just absolutely fucking massive these games were in the 2000s, and in some cases still are. And if you're not, here's a couple quick stats. The Call of Duty series alone has made over $15 billion and sold tens of millions of copies. The Guitar Hero games are the number one selling games for several years back in the mid-2000s, and the Madden series has sold over 130 million units. This really tells you how big gaming is. These numbers just absolutely dwarf even the biggest names in music, and a whole generation of kids grew up spending hundreds and hundreds of hours playing these games with Avenged Sevenfold as a huge part of the soundtrack. These songs got burned into their brains. But what made this so effective for Avenged Sevenfold is that they went beyond just simple song placement. I mean, anybody can do that, right? But they went way above and beyond that and earned the love of the gaming community. The clearest example of this is their integration with Call of Duty Black Ops 2. They've been in all the Black Ops games, but I think this is the one that really kind of highlights it. There's actually an Easter egg ending to the game. If you wait till after the credits, there's a full-on cutscene where they do some funny stuff with a few of the big characters in the game and play a song. And they actually released the 
this whole ending as a music video. Other bands would have just licensed the song to the game and called it a day, but these guys said, no, no, wait a minute, we fucking love this game, we want to do something cool here. And people noticed. And there's lots of other examples. Matt has always given lots of love to the gaming community, and they even released their own video game called Hail to the King Death Bat in 2014, which is actually pretty damn good. It wasn't a half-assed piece of shit like you'd expect for a band video game. You can tell that they really cared and put in the effort to make it a legit game, and it actually got pretty good reviews. And it might sound weird to those of you who aren't gamers, but I think this played a really big role in their success. They were getting placements in these gigantic mainstream games going back to 2003 before they broke through into TRL and all that. They got in front of millions and millions of people this way, and by showing the gaming community so much love, I think they also earned themselves a whole generation of diehard fans. Okay guys, that's my two cents on how Avengers Sevenfold got so big. And believe it or not, even though this video is really long, there's a ton more stuff that I wanted to include about like their stage names and the death bat and kind of all that branding kind of stuff. But I left it out for the sake of this video just because again, it's already too damn long. I could easily make an hour long video just about this band. That's how much there is to say about them. But that's enough for me. I want to hear from you guys. Let me know in the comments. What do you think were the keys to Avenged Sevenfold's success? What did I leave out of this video? Let me know in the comments and if you like this video or any my other videos. I would love it if you would give me a follow on Instagram. There's a link in the comments. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.